Thank you, Dr. Bimo, for that update in education. So to introduce our main program is Craig Dawson. So I'll uh, say a few words about Craig. Craig is president and CEO of Retail Lockbox. He also serves on the Seattle branch board of directors of the Federal uh, Reserve Bank. So a few fun facts about Craig. He was a varsity four-year letterman of the UW tennis t team. Yeah. <laughs> And I'll tell you, he still has it. I played uh, doubles against him a few years back, and my scrappiness and smack talk were no match for his skills. He had me working. <laughs> and he brought that fierceness to coaching his daughter. He said one of his most fun accomplishments was coaching his daughter's nine-year soccer and basketball teams. Basketball? Basketball teams do undefeated seasons back-to-back. -back. Please help me welcome Craig Dawson. Hello, Rotarians and guests. I have the great pleasure to introduce Darlene Wilzinski. She is Vice President and Regional Executive of the Seattle branch of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, the Fed. Ms. Wilzinski oversees the Seattle branch Board of Directors and their contribution to monetary policy decisions. She's also responsible for cash operations and relationships in the 12th District Northern Region. Ms. Wolzinski joined the Fed in October of 1997 as the Assistant Manager of Check Processing in Seattle. She's held a variety of management roles, including human resources and public information. Her role as a manager of the Seattle Check Operation, she consolidated the Portland Check Operation and ultimately closed both operations in lieu of electronic check clearing. Two million checks per day processed to two million images per day processed. In addition, she led the effort to move cash services from downtown Seattle to the new facility in Renton. Ms. Wolzinski received a Bachelor's of Science degree from the United States Naval Academy and served on active duty in the Navy for almost six years. She was in the Naval Reserve for another 17 years before retiring as commander, as a commander in 2009. She holds a master's degree in business administration and a certificate of organizational leadership from Chapman University and is a graduate of the Pacific Coast Banking School. She's gonna demystify the Fed for us today. She's gonna talk about the Fed's main job, its mandate for full employment and price stability. Those mandates are there to ensure the prosperity of our nation. She may even talk to you about or you may have questions about the inverted yield curve or the yield curve inversion. It's not inverted. <laughs> Some fun facts about Darlene. I noted that she was a graduate from the Naval Academy. She was in the sixth class of women to graduate from the Academy. She says her true legacy is her granddaughter, May, who turns one on April 2nd. Darlene's words are, May is the most amazing child ever born. <laughs> Please welcome Darlene Wozinski, San Francisco Federal Reserve. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Craig. It was all wonderful until you mentioned the yield curve. <laughs> if anyone realized in that introduction, there was never one word mentioned about being a PhD economist, okay? So let's just get that out of the way right now. But I'm happy at the end of this, so hope we'll be able to answer your questions. Um, I am honored to be here today, uh, demystifying the Fed. Um, I, I hope I can do that, but you know, that's a tough order. Uh, I will say this, though. Um, it has been an honor to serve at the Fed for so long, and, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But I'd really like to thank first Craig and Mark Davis for making sure that I could be here today to speak. Always glad to have the opportunity to get out into the public. And as you may notice in your handout, Craig's picture's there because he is a member of our board of directors, and we appreciate your service. Thank you, Craig. But of course, before I move on, I have to thank my Federal Reserve colleagues 
as Ken called him, my posse. I think it sounds better to say entourage, right? <laughs> Um, who are here to support me today. Thank you very much. They are an amazing team. If you get a chance to talk to them, please do. And one last thing before I kick things off. The remarks, my remarks today do not necessarily represent those of the Federal Reserve System, <laughs> the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, or the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, okay? The lawyers are all happy now. <laughs> So I find it interesting that we just talked, um, had Valerie speak about what happened um, in East Africa. I'd like to take you back a couple years and to talk about Hurricane Maria. It devastated Puerto Rico, as we all know. It, the storm destroyed homes, hospitals, and schools. It laid waste to the infrastructure in Puerto Rico. Maria caused the largest blackout in US history, and it was 11 months before the power was fully restored. On the news, we all saw what this disruption did to essential services like medical care and education. But the thing that people don't always think about is that when you don't have power, you don't have the internet, your credit cards and your debit cards don't work. So all of a sudden, you need cash. You need cash to buy food, water, and clothing. So after the storm, the demand for cash in Puerto Rico rose 700% on a day, over its daily norm. Well, I can tell you this, banks don't normally have that much cash on hand. So how are they gonna get that cash? And this is where the Federal Reserve came in. We coordinated with airlines, the banks in Puerto Rico, and the armored carriers. We flew enormous volumes of cash down to the island with regular infusions until the power came back on. This wasn't a one-time thing, though. We have done this, in, we've had similar efforts with uh, Hurricane Harvey that hit Houston and during other crises. Because this is one of our fundamental responsibilities, to manage our nation's cash flow and to ensure financial st stability in times of crisis. I like to tell people this story because I know the Fed can sometimes seem like a remote body a committee in DC sitting in a conference room making decisions about interest rates. And we've all seen those pictures over the years. But today I wanna to shed some light on what we do, including some things you may not even know that we do. I wanna talk about how we work to create and sustain a healthy economy in the Northwest and around the country. There we go. But before we get to that, I do want to tell you a little bit about my Fed story, and Craig mentioned some of this, but not just why I got to the Fed, but why I stayed. I was an officer in the Navy, along with my husband, who was a Navy pilot, and we got stationed out here on Whidbey Island about 30 years ago, and we fell in love with the Northwest. So after leaving the military, it was easy for my husband. He just went down the street and got a job flying for Alaska Airlines, which he still does today. I, however, had a little more difficult time figuring out what my career path was going to be. I was committed to public service, and I wanted to make a difference. That is what drew me to the Fed, first of all. It's public mission, and knowing that what I did made a difference to every American and most global citizens as well. That was 21 years ago, and I can tell you this, I'm a baby at the Fed. Most Fed employees, a large number of Fed employees have 30, even 40 years of service. In that time, I've held various roles in management, operations, and HR, and my connection to the Fed's mission has only grown stronger, and it's why three years ago, when the regional executive position came open, I threw my hat in the ring. And as regional executive, I'm responsible for recruiting and managing our board of directors, who provide an essential perspective on how the economy is working in Washington and Alaska. Business and community outreach is also a critical part of my job. Meeting with community members and hearing about what you're experiencing is easily the best and most meaningful part of my job. Meaningful because no matter who you are, the Fed has an impact on your life. Our mission is to support a strong and stable economy we want you to be able to achieve your goals, whether that's 
taking out a loan for a house, uh, saving for your children's education, starting a new business, planning for your retirement, or simply walking up to the ATM and getting your 20s out. Or maybe for some of you, that's hundreds. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's for you to know. Now I know maintaining a strong and stable economy sounds like a big and fairly vague goal. What does it really mean? Well, simply put, everyone who wants a job can get a job. The dollar in your pocket has consistent value and the financial system works day to day. So let's talk about the first two goals together because they're related. The Federal Reserve has what we call a dual mandate. We're pursuing maximum employment and price stability. So what does maximum employment mean? One of the most tangible and familiar markers is the monthly jobs report. And I know we've all heard that when it comes out at the beginning of every month for the previous month. A consistent and healthy amount of job growth, uh, job gains, excuse me, month to month is a good sign of a stable economy. So how do we keep things stable? We try to maintain a sustainable rate of employment. Now, sustainable doesn't mean 100%. Okay. In a healthy economy, there will always be movement. There will be people between jobs. It takes time to post for jobs, time to find the right people to fill them. So 0% unemployment is actually a counterproductive goal. So that is not something we strive for. Instead, we aim to reach that maximum, what we call maximum employment. That can vary depending on a number of factors. Right now, the unemployment rate is about 4% and this is near historic lows. So that's the first part of our mission, creating conditions for maximum employment. The second part of our mission is making sure the dollar maintains a consistent value. Whether you're running a business, raising a family, or just living your life, you need money. But that's not all you need. You also need your money to hold its value. That means a loaf of bread should cost about the same today as it will tomorrow. We tend to take the stability of the dollar for granted, but it isn't automatically guaranteed. It's the Fed's job to help the economy remain stable, especially during those difficult times. So it is a balancing act. As I mentioned before, these two goals, maximum employment and a stable dollar, are closely related. Imagine a scale. On one side, you have the employment rate. On the other side, you have inflation. They're connected. If it's too heavy on one side, the other side moves up. In a recession, when unemployment is high, the workforce side of the scale gets lighter and inflation sinks too low. To bring, back, to bring things back into balance, the Fed will cut the Fed funds rate to jumpstart the economy. This is our main monetary policy tool. But what happens when economic conditions start to heat up? Now, a lot of previously unemployed people are working again, weighing down that side of the scale, and we can see the corresponding rate of inflation, and we can see the corresponding rise in the rate of inflation, which could cause the dollar to become devalued like what we experienced in the 1970s. That's when the Fed, Fed will typically raise the Fed funds rate to help bring things back into balance. What we're aiming for is something our bank president, Mary Daly, likes to call a Goldilocks economy. One that's not too hot, not too cold, but that's just right for strong growth, low unemployment, and a steady low inflation rate of 2%. Achieving an economy that's just right is ultimately the responsibility of 19 individuals, the seven board of governors of the Federal Reserve System in Washington, D.C., and 12 presidents of the Fed's regional banks. Known as the Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC, they meet every six weeks to discuss the economy and set monetary pol policy to achieve the Fed's dual mandate. Given our broad national scope, you might wonder how we can be sure we're doing right by local regions like ours. After all, it's a lot different here in Washington than say in Alabama. But that's part of what makes the Fed so unique. Local input 
informs and drives the policy decisions we make at a national level. And because the Fed has a unique structure, it even manages to take politics out of the equation. We're accountable to the public, and we value transparency. That's why we release regular reports and transcripts of our meetings. We also are subject to financial audits and congressional oversight. And probably most of you saw last week, Chairman Powell gave his uh, regular press conference after the um, FOMC met. But the Fed does have considerable independence. The decisions, our decisions aren't ratified by Congress or by the White House. That's by design, because the Fed has the long-term health of the economy in mind, and sometimes the calls for short-term decision, that calls for short-term decisions that may not be viewed favorably by everybody. I might add the f that the Fed is self-funded. We don't rely on appropriations from Congress. This is also a really important factor in maintaining our independence. And I always throw this in as a side note, so, so people understand how we get our income, is the Federal Reserve primarily derives its, um, its funding from interest on U.S. government securities that is acquired through its open market operations. After it pays its expenses, though, the Fed turns the rest of the earnings over to the U.S. Treasury. About 95% of the Reserve Bank's net earnings since we um, began operations in 1914 have been turned into the U.S. Treasury. And just recently it was announced in 2018 we turned in $63.5 billion to the U.S. Treasury. So when those 19 participants in the FOMC meeting sit down, they are armed with a lot of data, a lot of research from, our respect, from their respective economic research departments. They also come with knowledge gained from interacting with business and community leaders. For example, the San Francisco Fed, our president and senior management, make it a point to get out in the community, whether it be for one-on-one -on -one meetings or gatherings such as this. We like to think of it as boots on the ground. The bank also has a handful of advisory councils to draw upon. Karen Lee currently sits on one of them in, uh, in San Francisco. But the most consistent and relied upon pipeline of economic observations comes from our board of directors. Every Fed office across the system has a board of directors and their input is invaluable. Fed boards of directors, especially at the branch level, don't operate like a typical corporate board. Board members' main contribution is to monetary policy, to the monetary policy process. You can see on the handout at your table the, the various Seattle branch board members. They meet eight times per year to provide feedback on specific questions that are asked by our economic research department. And they also offer observations, and this is something our president's really key into, on other topics that they feel are important. This information is critical as it helps bring clarity to the economic data we receive. And I might add there is a concerted effort to ensure there is a variety of industries, as you can see from our board, and organizations represented from across the Seattle zone, which encompasses Washington and Alaska. The, the economy doesn't end at the edge of King County, and it can look really different the farther you get away from the Seattle metropolitan area. At times, location maybe isn't necessarily a critical driver because many of the companies may have a regional, national, or even international presence to draw upon. In addition to what I've already mentioned, the board also takes a recommendation vote, as do all boards at the, in the Federal Reserve, and what it feels the interest rate for the Fed to charge through its discount window, which are overnight loans made by the Fed to depository institutions. The result of this vote, which is forwarded to the bank president, acts as an indicator of where board members see the economy and what they feel is appropriate monetary policy moving forward. I don't have much time. I need to talk about the cash. Go ahead, okay. <laughs> Ken already told me I failed because I didn't bring samples of cash. So I, I you know, I'm, I, I'm hoping I can only go up from here. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move on to supporting. Um, so I explained those uh, maximum employment and price stability. So let's move on 
to the supporting role of uh, supporting the financial system. This generates a lot fewer headlines, but we need to be sure that we are um, doing this job as well as the other. So how does the Fed support the financial system? By making sure currency is available, payments are being processed, financial institutions are behaving responsibly, and shocks to the system can be absorbed. I'll start with cash, since that's been the biggest part of my career at the Fed, and I know many of the people sitting at this table. But it is one of the most tangible things we work on. When you go to the ATM, if you have money in your account, after you push all the buttons, you should be able to get that stack of 20s out, right? But remember, cash is only at the bank because the Federal Reserve helped move it there. The Fed manages cash flow throughout the country so that whenever you need money in your pocket, you can put it there. And it's noted on the handout how much we at the Seattle branch, our cash operations process each month. When depository institutions de deposit their unneeded cash with us, we destroy unfit currency and we identify suspected counterfeit currency. In turn, we supply depository institutions with currency so they can meet the demands of their customers. That's all of you. My least favorite slide. So speaking of cash operations, one of the most incredible things, and I know Craig really wanted me to show the video uh, that we showed, but it's an internal Fed video only of our move from downtown Seattle back in 2008. Uh, we outgrew our building in downtown, and we needed to build a, because vaults the size that we needed don't come, like we can't just go out and purchase one. We had to build it ourselves. I'll never forget, and I know many of us here uh, at this table won't forget the, amounting, the, the amazing amount of logistics and planning that it took to move all that cash 15 miles down the road within a few sh short hours. So we moved all our currency out of the facility, and as you can imagine, on 2nd Avenue, and it's, I, the building has been, is being remodeled right now, uh, so, as I last saw, but we couldn't do it in the normal way that we, we would normally move currency in and out. So we literally rolled containers of currency out to the curb, put them on forklifts, lifted them in the back of the semi-tractor trailer, and off we went. Now, that sounds a little crazy and a little risky, uh, and it, or a Hollywood movie. I know many, I, I sat there and I said, I'm, I'm living a Hollywood movie here tonight uh, as I stood on the street in 2nd Avenue. But it was a very controlled process because we're all about controls. Uh, <laughs> we had an overwhelming presence of law enforcement. We had six different agencies led by the Secret Service helping us manage this flow. So it was all under control. <laughs> now I know a lot of things that I hear from folks are, why do you need a bigger building? Cash is going away, everything's going digital. Why would you need that? Well, I'm here to tell you that's wrong thinking. It's true, electronic payment systems and services like PayPal and Venmo have changed the payment landscape. But you might be surprised to learn that we still use a lot of cash. As of January of this year, there is 1.7 trillion US dollars in circulation around the world. And the dollar value of currency in circulation has more than doubled since 2007 alone. And millennials, they use cash just as much as any other generation. Don't let them tell you anything different. So while the Fed does move a lot of cash around, we also facilitate other payment processing from checks to electronic payments, and we have other day-to-day -day responsibilities too. The Fed plays an important regulatory and supervisory role that helps ensure banks and other financial institutions play by the rules. We promote consumer protection, fair lending, and community development. We also provide financial services for the U.S. government so it can conduct its business. These lesser known responsibilities keep our financial system strong and they give the economy the resilience to absorb shocks to the system. There we go. Oh. So I started this presentation with a story about how we supported Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, but I would like to end with something a little closer to home. Last week, we had the fifth anniversary of the Oso landslide, 
and I know many of you remember what it was like watching the TV, watching the recovery operations there. What many people didn't realize is that Darrington was cut off. They had no access to the internet. And we got a phone call that day, and I remember Trent contacting me about this. Um, there's one bank in the town of Darrington, and all of a sudden, they didn't have any way to handle credit debit cards. They needed cash, and they needed it right away. So we worked with the bank and their armored carrier, and we got them the cash that they needed to continue. Um, you know, I, The way I look at it is we helped that community start its recovery process. And I take great pride in that. And I know we're prepared to handle other crises just like that. And I know my team here, they feel the same way. It's an important part of what we do. So there you have it, a short primer on the Federal Reserve. I hope I demystified, I, like I said, I think that's a heavy lift. But I'm happy to answer any questions. I'll, uh, I'll start off with the first question on the inverted yield curve. Mary Daly was quoted yesterday as saying all the hoopla was probably grossly overblown regarding the inverted yield curve. And since you've already disclaimed that your remarks reflect the views of the FRB, I'd like your opinion on whether uh, that's a, 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 an ominous harbinger or just a, a statistical aberration. Well, I love our president. She's, if, if anyone's had the opportunity to meet her, she's, she's a spitfire. And I liked it. The way she said it was, I'm not freaking out. Yeah. <laughs> That's what she said. I'm not freaking out. Um, I think, and, and it was funny, because I also read a, a speech yesterday given by the president of the Dallas Fed, um, President Kaplan. And I think, you know, one of the things we think about, in the, you know, data is extremely important to the Fed. We, we really rely on the data that we get, both from our directors, but from our economic research. And one data point, one shift, doesn't necessarily a trend make. And I think what President Kaplan said yesterday was really apropos. He says, we'll have to have several months of this before we have to start thinking about maybe doing something different. But we're not freaking out. I'm not freaking out. I'm good. Thank you for your comments. Um, I was hoping you could elaborate just a little bit on uh, preparing for disasters and talk about how you are anticipating or preparing for something like the big one. We always talk about a major catastrophic earthquake in this area. Thank you for that, because um, it is something we pre prepare for quite a bit. And in fact, when uh, we had, uh, was it three years ago, two, two, three years ago, we had the big um, emergency drill, and we had several states, as well as British Columbia, all working together. We actually had a seat at that table. And we do prepare for it. We have what we call buddy banks. So if something should happen to our S Seattle facility here, we have other federal reserves that are ready to step up and make sure we have that infusion of cash because we have found time and time after again from Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, or Super, Superstorm Sandy, whatever it was called, um, that cash is, is, is king in those, at those moments. And so we are prepared to step up and make sure that we have a place at the table. A question from Jack Lauterbaum. Uh, let's take Puerto Rico, for example. You don't have power for, you said, 9 or 10 or 11 months. Mm -hmm. How do pe people don't have cash at home and they can't go to their ATM? What do they do? Well, what we saw in Puerto Rico is uh, they would go to their local bank, and the local bank would just hand out what they had there, what was available. But it was a big logistical issue. I mean, when we think about losing power, we don't think about the fact that we can't get gas, we can't pump gas into our cars, how do, how do we get all these things that we're going to need to survive, right? And so uh, we had a case where it was one of the islands out in the Pacific lost their internet connection. So they used satellite phones to call back to the banks in Hawaii, the headquarters, and said, Bob wants to take $20 out. Does he have $20 in his account? So people will find a way to make that happen. And I will also say the Fed looks at, when they go in and look at banks, they look at their business continu continuity plans and look for how they will recover from these types of things. We have a question over here for Kath from Kathy Williams. Thank you. Your presentation's been very interesting. A question that I've had for quite a while, and you alluded to it, is uh, the 
uh, 12th district is so much larger in terms of population coverage than the others. Has there been thought of redistributing the uh, banks or is there more emphasis when the governors d make their discussions? Does 12th district have more uh, effect uh, or how does that balance out? Wow, that's, that's ooh, I'm demystifying now, right? Uh, <laughs> so if you think about it, our structure and when we came into being was in 1913, okay? And so the way we were set up was based on where the capital was, the banking capital was in this country. And if you think about that, back in the early 1900s, it was pretty heavy in the East Coast and maybe a little bit more in Midwest and hardly anything out here on the West Coast. So that's why you see what you have, the kind of structure you have today. It would take reopening the Federal Reserve Act by Congress to do something like that, to redistribute, and that's probably not something we're ready to do. As far as influence, it's interesting. All the presidents have an equal influence, and in fact, if you look out there, you will see many of the presidents out giving speeches, having their points of view. And we want that. We want that diverse opinion out there. And, but when they all come to the table, they come together, they share those views, and they're all equally weighted on um, when they come to that group, to the FOMC, and when they're talking. So there is no real, um, I would say, mismatch one over the other. Back right corner, a question from Neil Larson. There's been uh, quite a change since December in uh, the direction of interest rates. I was wondering if you could comment on any information that you're aware of that has caused the Fed to change the direction of its sentiment. Well, I think a good thing to look at was particularly um, Chairman Powell's comments from last week at his press conference. I was reading over that last night just to prepare. Um, <laughs> uh, I think what our biggest concern right now from what he said in there was not necessarily an issue particularly related to the United States, except maybe trade is always maybe a concern or ongoing issues with, um, with China and Europe. But really, the headwinds may come from overseas and their impact on us because we are, you know, our economies are global in nature now. We have one last question from Bill Hammond. Thank you very much for your remarks. I had a question about the totality of the national debt and how that affects what the policy uh, of the Federal Reserve may be. How do you factor that? Um, some people are saying it doesn't matter. Some people say it matters a lot. What's your opinion? Well, again, as a, not being an economist, I can't comment on monetary policy per se and, and that, but I would say that if you look at, uh, Chair Powell has said this, that, that you know, this is an unsustainable path and it's something that needs to be dealt with. When we talk about things that might be a political in nature, we don't talk about the politics and the good and the bad. What we talk about is the impact on the economy. So we will look at it as how it affects the economy and how do we maintain stability. Thank you very much.